In the last few decades, our culture has gone through several changes. And one of the major shifts that we have gone through and we have seen is the emphasis on justice and the swiftness in executing justice. When a person does something wrong, there is an immediate demand to bring that person to justice. There is an immediate demand and action to punish that person. And we see this often in churches, in society, in the media. If somebody is accused of something, that person is immediately, you know, uh, there is action taken against that person and uh, that person is dismissed or suspended or, you know, or any other form of punishment is given to that person. Of course, the emphasis on justice is not bad. In fact, it is good. It is very good. But the problem seems to be that this insistence on justice, this emphasis on justice, often becomes judgmental. This means there is very little space, if any, for mercy or compassion. There is no patience for repentance or change. There is no real opportunity. There is no real space for comforting and healing people who are suffering from guilt and suffering from various kinds of heartbreaks. If a person is wrong, and that's it. That's the end of the story. There's no second chance. There is no way in which we can accept that's the end of the story. And of course, as we can imagine, this makes everybody self-righteous. There is a sense of self-righteousness that creeps in and feels that, and we start to feel, oh, that person is, is wrong, and so that person is beyond redemption, as if we are better than them. But we do know the importance of patience and compassion. We know the need for comfort and encouragement. More than ever, we know our world today needs forgiveness. It needs more grace. It needs more mercy. If only people will take the time to be patient and sit and listen and talk, the world would be a much better place. We know that sometimes major wars and, 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 and conflicts can be resolved or could be avoided by listening, by patience, by forgiveness, by more mercy. We see these things being emphasized or exemplified in the life and ministry of St. John the Baptist. As we know, John is an important figure, a key figure during the season of Advent. We know that John was the forerunner to Christ, the one sent to prepare the way for our Lord, the Messiah, to appear and to accomplish his work of salvation. So John is, in some sense, crucial in understanding the ministry of Jesus, the salvation offered in Jesus. Sometimes we think we kind of take Jesus you know, out of the box and think you know, we can understand you know, what's going on. But we need to place Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, within the larger context. But the problem, again, is that when we consider John, John the Baptist, his ministry is simply considered as a one of condemnation, of one of judgment. We often assume that John simply went around frightening people, <laughs> frightening the life of the people to repent of their sins and baptizing them, somewhat like our, some of our you know, uh, fire and brimstone preachers 
you know, today who love preaching about God's judgment and hell, frightening people. If you don't repent, you're going to suffer in hell. You're going to be, you know, in the roasting, you know, fire. So you better change so that you can be, you can cool off in heaven, so to speak. However, John's ministry has another important element, component, that of comforting and encouraging the people. That is, preparing the way for Christ involved reminding the people of people about God's compassion and God's forgiveness. In a way, this is precisely why the people came to him to be baptized in the first place. They did not come because they wanted to join the church or because they wanted to go to heaven. Now remember, all these ideas, these teachings came later after Jesus. This was the teachings of the early church. But the baptism of John, the message of John was slightly different. It was about repentance, but it was also about encouragement. It was about comforting a people who were already suffering every day under the hands of the powerful Roman Empire. Those who were suffering with guilt because of a self-righteous and an indifferent religious leadership who are simply imposing more and more laws upon them and saying, you should do this, you should do that. Oh, you didn't do that? Oh, then you're a sinner. Then you're, a, then you're, a, you're excommunicated from the community and so on and so forth. Guilt and pain and suffering in many ways mark the lives of many people. And John came as a, a you may say, a bomb in Gilead. A healing, a healer, so to speak. The people came to John because they could hear in the message of John about God's love and God's mercy and God's justice. They could hear words of comfort and healing and restoration in John's preaching. The early church believed that John was actually living out the prophecy of Isaiah which we heard as the first lesson this morning. Isaiah cries out to a people again who were in suffering, people who were in exile, actually, reminding them or telling the words of God, communicating the words of God, comfort, comfort my people. And then goes on to say, tell them that their sins have been forgiven. The penalty has been paid. Tell them not to fear Tell them to be encouraged. Tell them that God understands that human beings are frail like a grass. God has not forgotten them. Comfort. Comfort them with these words. In a context where people live in fear of guilt, both during the time of Isaiah and, and during the time of John the Baptist, when people were living in, in, in fear of guilt and judgment and punishment, John said, there is another way. Isaiah said, there is another way. A way of grace. A way of mercy and forgiveness. Advent, my dear sisters and brothers, is a time, of, is a time that reminds us that the church too, like John the Baptist, has been called to prepare the way for the coming of Christ. But what this means is that, among other things, being the comforting presence of God in this world. There is enough judgment around us. There is enough condemnation around us. There is enough guilt around us. Sometimes we don't notice this, but people who actually are violent, people who have hate in them, act in that manner because they are actually hurt. Because they come from a place of guilt and frustration and they take it out on other people. Including, as you may know, people like Hitler came from a turbulent childhood and they take it out on other people. And we see this again and again repeated in many people and sometimes even among us, even us. Sometimes the, the, the blind spots 
our mistakes, our shortcomings are a reflection of what we have deep within us. And that's why we go to therapists, right? They try to help us out there and counselors. But this is precisely why there is need for comforting. There is need for encouragement today. Of course, we need to emphasize and stand for justice. We too have to be judgmental at times. But along with that, there is also the need for reminding each other of God's mercy, of God's grace, of God's forgiveness. I think today more than ever, people need to hear it is okay. God gives us another chance, especially our younger people, the younger people in our communities, people who turn to drugs, people who turn to all sorts of things, people who turn to you know, various kinds of addictions today, have to be reminded, have to be comforted, more than be condemned. There is need for healing the brokenhearted, the guilty hearts today. As disciples of Christ, my dear sisters and brothers, may we be ready to be and offer spaces of healing, spaces for listening, spaces for forgiveness for each other and for those around us. And may we recommit ourselves like John, like Isaiah, to comforting and encouraging each other with words and actions of love 